So I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce William Wang. Uh, William is one of the uh, really rising stars in machine learning uh, across, across academia. Uh, he is one of the Mellichamp uh, chairs, uh, you know, uh, across UCSB, uh, but particularly he's uh, focused on machine learning, uh, natural language processing, uh, he's very influential, both not only in the technical community, in the uh, academic community, but also uh, he writes a microblog that he has 100,000 followers, a couple million views a month. Uh, in addition, he's often quoted in you know, cross literature as a PhD from Carnegie Mellon. And uh, he, he, runs our, uh, he runs the National Language Processing Center. He runs the Center for Responsible Machine Learning uh, here at UCSB, and he's also the lead for AI and Machine Learning and Institute for Energy Efficiency. With that, I'd like to introduce William and he's gonna talk about uh, energy the intersection of energy efficiency and, and machine learning. Uh, so William, you're on, thank you very much. And we look forward to your talk. Thank you, thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Great, uh, thanks Mark for the very kind introduction. Thanks John for having me. Uh, it is my great honor to talk about some of the interesting things happening in the data center these days, which is the growing uh, demand of computation, specifically in AI, right? So, uh, so the hope is that, you know, I'm going to show you some challenges and some of our uh, unique solutions that we're working on with uh, the IE projects, okay? So um, one thing I think we all agree is that since 2012, things change a lot in AI and machine learning. And this is specifically driven by, uh, you know, an effort from Stanford. So this is ImageNet. So it is a 1 million image database with very specific labels, right? So it's not about just birds and cats. So it's object classification, but it's very specific species of birds and cats and dogs and all that, right? So a lot of very fine grained labels, a million examples labeled by humans so that, you know, we can use supervised learning uh, to train uh, the supervised learning models. And if you look at the right hand side, here is the ImageNet performance. So it is an open challenge. It was uh, there for about uh, six or seven years. So initially, um, the performance without deep learning is just about, you know, 25 or 28% error rate, right? So uh, pretty high. One in three images in general, you get a wrong label. But with the introduction of deep learning in 2012, the first model is an Al AlexNet, right? So it's a convolutional neural network model. So we see very significant reduction in error rate. So by the time they retire the ImageNet challenge, in about 2015, uh, the best performance is actually 3.5, right? So this is actually better than human performance. Um, this is uh, definitely remarkable and uh, uh, it's driven a lot of the changes in uh, the computation in the cloud. Uh, the other thing I want to briefly mention is that uh, not just supervised learning, right? So reinforcement learning also started to gain some tractions in the machine learning community in recent years. So comparing to reinforcement learning, uh, one of the challenges is that it is uh, very simple inefficient in a sense that you need a lot more examples uh, to be able to teach the reinforcement learning agent to do well. But if you actually have a very good setting, so for example, the AlphaGo, the latest version of AlphaGo is essentially two players playing with each other, right? Both are uh, AI systems. And if you ask them to play for 40 days, right? Uh, then you'll be able to build the AlphaGo Zero system on the cloud and be able to beat all of the previous versions of human and AI system, right? So this is definitely amazing achievement, but the latest version in 2018, it requires 40 days to train, right? Even with Google's computation. So. Uh, definitely simple efficiency is an issue and we're going to go to that um, in the next few minutes. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that in addition to computer vision and uh, natural language processing is also a very important area. So every day you search some items on Google or, you know, Microsoft uh, Bing, then, um, you know, it's essentially a query, right? And then the query is actually processed using deep learning these days. So this only happened last year. 
that all of the queries in the past were using just keywords based, but now it's completely uh, based on deep learning, specifically based on this BERT model that was uh, released in uh, late 2018, right? And uh, some of the uh, results on BERT is also very promising that uh, there's this general glue benchmark in NLP that measures the accuracy on various of different tasks, for example, reading comprehension, uh, natural language inference, uh, sentiment classification. Uh, in general, it can get to almost, um, you know, human baseline uh, for this very specific settings uh, with this new BERT model. Uh, today, I want to specifically mention not just the background of the growth in the past few years, but this is a very interesting concept that, you know, we discuss in our IEE workshop 2.0 is that we really need to think beyond just optimizing accuracy, right, in all of my previous examples, but to think about the carbon emission, but to think about the massive computational power, right? So uh, we actually uh, promoted and came up with the term green AI, and the hope was that, you know, instead of just focusing on accuracy, but now we can uh, take a look at carbon emission, we can take a look at computational costs, and ideally, the hope is that we're going to build uh, better AI systems, but try to also constrain the cost and constrain the carbon emission associated with this gi gigantic uh, neural network models. Um, why is this important, right? So um, I think this is very familiar with you with uh, most law. So the x axis here is year, and y axis is the petaflux per second for days. So what does that mean? It means if you do one petaflop of computation for a second, right? And you do that for how many days, right? So you can see that before 2012 in general, uh, most laws still hold, but after 2012, uh, we see about 3.4 months of doubling in computation requirements in AI. Uh, for example, uh, DQN I briefly mentioned, AlexNet briefly mentioned, ResNet, VGG, these are the best performing models for object recognition and for NLP neural machine translation completely replace all the prior uh, models in Google Translate. Um, uh, the same with AlphaGo Zero, but um, this is uh, definitely uh, changing the computing landscape in the, uh, in the cloud these days. Um, yeah, so in uh, many different areas in AI, for example, in natural language processing, this is the same, right? So earlier this year, you can see on the top right, Microsoft uh, created this uh, Turing natural language generation model that requires, um, you know, updates of 17 billion parameters in this machine learning model, right? You can see earlier models in 2018, while somewhere between, you know, 100 million parameters to 300 million, we thought that's really a lot of parameters to update, right? When you're doing uh, this uh, forward pass and backward pass, doing a backprop to update the model parameters. But now earlier this year, we get to 17 billion parameters. Some of you are aware of the OpenAI's uh, GPT-3 model, which is still the R natural language processing model. Uh, that has 10 times of the parameters and that went to 175 billion parameters. Um, and it's definitely, uh, you know, growing really fast uh, every a few months. Um, the other challenge I want to briefly mention is that, um, you know, for, for our, you know, colleagues working in hardware, this is a challenge because the neural network architectures are not static, right? It is actually very actively ch uh, changing over the past few years. So in the beginning, when I talk about VGG and AlexNet, those were based on convolutional neural network, right? So very specific type of neural network. And then a few years later, there are a lot of people looking at, you know, recurrent neural network and LSTMs, long short term memory networks. But like I said, in 2018, again, this whole, uh, you know, landscape change in machine learning with the introduction of the transformer model, which is a very recent architecture that got safety art performance in many different tasks in natural language processing and computer vision, right? So, um, and comparing to the prior models, um, you can think about this as a graph model, right? So 
uh, it is a graph model that has, you know, uh, multiple attention heads and within each attention head, as you can see in the green boxes, well, what you don't see is that there are also, you know, key value and query embeddings that essentially does the computation of looking at the attention to other uh, input tokens. So you can think about this as a graph model, but um, it is very effective, uh, but definitely requires uh, more computation comparing uh, to the prior models, such as the current neural network models and uh, convolution neural network models. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is the cost, right? So this is, again, I think uh, last year, right? So if you look at last year's number, and if you want to train one model that's outperformed BERT, um, so this is the XLNet model, again, by Google and CMU, uh, it takes you about a quarter of a million dollars to train just one single model, right? Without, you know, really tuning the hyperparameter or change um, you know, much of the uh, settings. So you can only train one model and this one model will cost you about uh, $245,000. Uh, so definitely very expensive. It's almost uh, not affordable for uh, academia uh, to be able to catch up with this uh, computation. Um, so why are we, uh, you know, requiring more computation, right? In addition to the uh, architecture changes, um, I want to give you some insights about what's driven this big demand of computing in AI models. So take a look at this particular example in natural language processing. So it's not just the models are changing, right? But also the size of the training set is changing. So it used to be the case that, you know, 20 years ago, we look at 0.03 billion words, right? In the Wall Street Journal for training our model. But these days when we're looking at training set, well, it's 35 billion words, right, of the number of tokens in your corpus. Uh, this is definitely a huge jump. And uh, parameter size, already talk about that model size, right? So Turing and LG, 17 billion, but the most recent one, I don't have it here, is uh, GPT-3, 175 billion uh, parameters. Um, and other things are uh, also uh, very important to know. For example, the number of layers in a neural network models can grow uh, very quickly from, you know, earlier 12 layers right now to uh, 78 layers. And in some of the computer vision, uh, you know, architectures, we need more than a thousand layers, right? So that's uh, definitely taking the time to do uh, back propagation much longer. The same is with the attention head, right? So like I said, the, the latest model that works the better is not recurrent model, it's not convolutional model, it's this attention-based model like transformer. And you, you can think about it as a graph model, but you're learning the, you know, the attention between uh, an input token to other tokens, right? So how many attention heads do you need? Well, we need to create many copies to capture different uh, latent information. And some of the models, you know, really requires more than 100 attention heads. And uh, similarly, um, you know, you can also control the dimension of the uh, continuous vector to represent information, and that's also growing, right? With more and more data, you can imagine that we need more, uh, you know, uh, in uh, more si uh, larger sizes in the embedding to capture uh, the data such that we can generalize better so we can also memorize uh, some information in the training set. Um, carbon emission, this is a key topic that I want to discuss today, right? So there are definitely some consequences of training this uh, gigantic uh, neural models in uh, machine learning AI these days. So there's this seminar study from uh, UMass that was published last year. So they were looking at, in general, the carbon emission in pounds, comparing, you know, in general, you know, what is the, you know, human life, right, consumption for a year. The average is about 11,000 pounds. But if you look at the training one single neural model, right, so with tuning and experimental uh, experimentation, it's about 78,000 pounds, right? So it's already eight times of uh, one, you know, person's annual emission. And if you want to do some, you know, amazing things, let's say achieve the best result on this leaderboard, while well, you often have to do neural architecture search, which is automatically configuring your uh, neural model with the best 
parameters. And this can take up to 626,000 pounds, right? So this is like 62, right, times of the uh, carbon emission uh, comparing to one person per year. So definitely uh, crazy and it is still uh, growing. Um, some people might know that, um, you know, there are constantly these new models getting introduced, right? So for example, for these dialogue models that was introduced in, uh, you know, by Google, and this one actually takes uh, 1.5, uh, million dollar, right, to train this one single model. And it's using uh, the TPU with, with three parts, which is kind of relatively uh, recent, but it still uh, requires uh, 30 days, right, to train even with more than 2000 TPU cores. Uh, very, very expensive. And, um, but that's not a recent number, right? So like I told you, the most recent number is this OpenAI GPT-3 model that has 175 billion parameters that costs about $4.6 million to train one single model. So almost impossible for you know, anyone else to replicate uh, this model, yet it got the best performance. So OpenAI used to you know, make everything open source. Now they started you know, licensing and creating APIs uh, for uh, paper use to access the GPT-3 model. But uh, it comes with a very high cost, I think, to uh, to energy uh, efficiency. Um, so what I talk about so far is about training, right? So in natural language processing, in computer vision or in machine learning in general, it's not just about training a gigantic model, right? You can do that offline, you can put that in the cloud, but it's also about inference, right? So inference is that in the testing time that your users is gonna send these queries and you're gonna send these queries to your trained model to get a result, right? For example, search query. So if you type anything, um, this is going to be an inference call, right? To your trained BERT model and the BERT model will compute, right? A uh, k-dimensional vector going back, right? To the system. And this will be used to compute a dot product between all the documents and find the closest one return to uh, show it to you. So this is one inference API call, but not just training, inference also costs a lot, right? So if you run in this, uh, you know, data centers and if you're, you know, running a big business, uh, this is also a huge cost comparing to uh, training, right? Because you get a lot of this cost uh, um, every single uh, second. So this can also take a lot of money for uh, inference as well. Um, that's why um, at the IE and the Center for Responsible Machine Learning, we started to think about how to change the landscape of doing, uh, you know, neural uh, network research, right? So in addition to chase this leaderboard like ImageNet or Glue Benchmark that wholly focusing on accuracy, we started to think about the cost, right? And think about the time and also think about the carbon emission. So we built this Hulk benchmark that, uh, you know, look at multiple uh, phases of the uh, neural network pipeline. So in addition to uh, training, so we separate this into pre-training and fine tuning all specific problems and also look at the inference costs as well. So we build a benchmark that not just look at the accuracy, but look at when you want to get to 90% accuracy, what's the numbers of hours, right? We need to uh, get to that accuracy and what's the cost, right? On let's say some regular uh, cloud, let's say like AWS and what's the number of parameters you need um, so that we are able to compare um, the energy efficiency version of the achievements in neural networks. So this is one of our latest work. And clearly uh, using our model, uh, we're taking a energy efficiency view, right? Over the uh, achievement of neural networks. So in addition to accuracy to a certain level, we look at the time, we have a score uh, weighted by uh, many different factors uh, so that in this case, uh, the performance can be measured not just by accuracy, but also by uh, many different factors uh, regarding to uh, energy efficiency and carbon emission, okay? Um, some of the latest work um, in our lab also look, looking at, you know, uh, neural information retrieval, right? So I just talked to you that, um, you know, completely right now the uh, search engine has switched to neural information retrieval 
And this also has a very high cost to train the model and doing the inference. Recently, we had uh, some work with Facebook AI and started to look at the smaller models, right, to train uh, the system. So our latest model only needs about eight GPUs with, uh, you know, to train the system. And it's about 10 times faster uh, comparing to the existing uh, inference time. And we're still able to achieve the CFDR performance by basically create a shared encoder for a user's query and also to encode uh, the, uh, the uh, top K search results. So we're able to get a pretty good result, but much more uh, faster time in the inference and also much more smaller footprint in the training uh, process. Right, so uh, this is pretty much uh, what I want to tell you today. So hopefully uh, you get to know a little bit about the challenges in uh, you know, neural computation these days and also get to know a little bit about uh, you know, the cause and the uh, carbon footprint and also some of our recent work with IEE on reducing the, uh, the cost and improving the energy efficiency. So uh, thank you very much and I'm very happy to answer questions. All right, I was muted. Um, so, so questions for, I know that uh, Catherine who's on uh, from at Facebook has some things she wanted to uh, perhaps ask you about. So Catherine, if you'd like to ask any of your questions, feel free. Okay, so, so uh, Catherine was actually asking about uh, the different workloads you're applying your work to. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned some of them, but uh, I think she wanted you to elaborate on some of that. Uh, you mean for, uh, for, which, for which project? Specifically on, um, uh, in, you know, like the things you're using the Hulk benchmark for, like what different applications, it's not a lot, it's a lot of NLP and various things, but what, can you talk about that a little bit? Right, right. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So we look at a couple of different things, right? So uh, in addition to NLP, we also look at uh, ImageNet, right? So there are some ex existing benchmark, but uh, we also started to look at uh, uh, object recognition, right? So what is the uh, inference cost and what is the cost of, let's say, get to 5% um, error rate uh, for the ImageNet as well. But in general, um, there is a very diverse set of applications of AI going on in the data centers, uh, not just, you know, computer vision and NLP, these are the two largest one in machine learning and AI these days, but uh, there are also other ones. So far, we are looking at um, mainly computer vision and NLP, but I think in the future, it's definitely also possible to uh, think about, uh, for example, reinforcement learning, right? So how would you be able to uh, improve the uh, sample efficiency and how would you be able to get to a certain level of performance, but also, uh, you know, averaging, you know, all this costs that uh, associated with it. Okay, and um, uh, I wanted to give you a chance, one more thing, I wanted to give you a chance to mention your uh, summit next week. Uh, for folks in this audience who might be interested. Thank you, thank you, Mark. So um, we, um, we actually have a very interesting summit going on for uh, next Friday. So this is the Center for Responsible Machine Learning Summit on AI and COVID-19. We all have very different uh, set of speakers and all our international uh, leading researchers uh, in very different topics. So if this includes uh, contact tracing, include uh, vaccine design, includes a large uh, computation required to do this vaccine design uh, and also forecasting. So it should be a very fun event. Uh, if you want to go to ml.ussb.edu, you'll be able to find a ways to uh, register this event. And this is free to everyone and uh, you can all uh, register. And again, thank you very much, John, for inviting me. And thank you, Mark, uh, for uh, hosting this event. And uh, I think we'd give you a hand. Thank you so much. Uh, John, if you wanted to say a few closing remarks and William, please stick around in case there's any more questions that come through in the next minute or two. Whatever, so. 
Thank you, William. That was extraordinary. Um, really puts a fine point on the problem that we have of how much energy, energy is used to do all these uh, inferences and, and uh, queries. And, and uh, so we, we as a community have to be much better at, at building more efficient data centers and, and continue the excellent work that's going on for the last 20 years. It's phenomenal how much more efficient data centers are today than they were. Uh, but with this continued growth, we're nowhere close to where we need to be. So um, I want to, I thought, uh, you know, it was a, a really good day, really good presentations, very good panels. Um, and uh, we have two more workshops coming up, which were mentioned at the beginning. And uh, I think you'll all get notified about them uh, in other areas. And there's Williams next week. So uh, we're, yep. we appreciate all, all the input. So yeah, thank just you all. Just to repeat them again, um, two weeks from today, there is the Smart Societal Infrastructure uh, Workshop, which is focused on uh, sort of the, the grid and anything interesting that attaches to it, like buildings, electric vehicle, electric vehicle charging. And then the following week on the 23rd is the Food Energy Water Nexus, which is very interesting issues, set of issues around how our food system works, how our energy and water systems are all interact, and that, that's some really cool stuff. And we'll have folks there from the agricultural industry and it's a very, very interdisciplinary space. So thank you all so much, John, anything else to say? Uh, that was a great day. All right. Thank you all. Okay. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks John. Good meeting. Very good. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.